This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Chad Hopkins, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Katie White. Katie, how are you doing? Good. Crazy. Moved a couple days ago, so life is a little chaotic. If you hear an echo on my mic, it's because I have nothing in my apartment because I have no furniture or rugs. So it's a pretty... uh, (laughs) live hot room right now and uh, hopefully that will change soon because this is the only chair I have to sit on and life is a little sparse right now but (laughs) um yeah it's good much better living situation much better uh apartment so pretty excited good it's been like a week and a half since we recorded so a lot has happened to me surprisingly in the tail end of my summer I went uh to the beach for a few days got a really bad sunburn kids wear sunscreen (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. this week I went to the movies four times so far. So that was exciting. Cramming and all of your summer viewing into the last couple. Yeah, of- as, as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been good times. And now I'm glad to be back recording. Awesome. Well, let's get going. Yeah. So starting off with introductions, I we, we got several new Apple podcast reviews since the last time we recorded. We got one from Gator fan, Mr. B, one from Mike Cthulhu. One from Raw141311, and then one from M. Lynn McCausland. I want to specifically highlight the one from Raw because it's one of my favorite reviews we've ever gotten. Because they say that our podcast has the unintended benefit of putting them to sleep almost instantaneously. (laughs) And that we're better than NyQuil, and we have soothing voices, and... Uh, that th- this person, Ra, is going to mention the podcast to their brother who struggles with insomnia. So <laughs> I love this so much. I, I mean, I, I do take it as a compliment because it means that we're, we're pleasant in addition to whatever <laughs> else we are. Uh, I, I, I have recently told like a, a YouTuber that I watch on Twitter that, um, that I, the best compliment I can give them is that their videos are entertaining and informative and I put them on when I want to go to sleep sometimes because it's just, it's peaceful. It's nice to watch it. So, uh, I'm glad that we have the same effect towards you. It's indicative, I think of a good rhythm. And I like that. It's something predictable. I totally high compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, (laughs) it's funny because there's this podcast I listen to called sleep with me, which is, uh, Mm -hmm. meant for that purpose. It's, it's meant for putting people asleep and it just talks about nonsense until you fall asleep. But if you can listen to nonsense about the office, then, uh, (laughs) even better. So thank you so much for the review. We also have a Facebook recommendation from David. So thank you to the five of you for your reviews and recommendations this week. And now moving on to our episode discussion, we are talking about the episode Here Comes Trouble. It aired on October 25th of 2012, was directed by Claire Scanlon, and written by Owen Ellickson. It is Halloween again at Dunder Mifflin. Andy has brought in his college acapella group, Here Comes Trouble, to perform a concert at the Halloween party. Jim has a big meeting with his sports marketing business, and Dwight finds a mysterious pill on the office floor. Starting off, Andy has brought in Here Comes Trouble, his college a cappella group. From the beginning, he's chatting with them. He's trying to impress upon them memories from his time as part of the group. He even talks about in a talking head how it's like, yeah, it's kind of pathetic to be reliving your youth through these younger people, but who cares? I wasn't me until I was in this group in college. And throughout the episode, as he tries to interact with them more and they don't seem all that interested, um, he, he gets devastated. When first, they think that Broccoli Rob, who's a name we have heard before, they thought that he was, quote, the boner champ. And I'm going to say now, I'm already uncomfortable with how many times we're probably going to say the word boner in this episode. (laughs) Maybe we should have a count. That's two. That's two already. Um, I mean, like I said, Andy says that he did become him. He did not become Andy or Andrew Bernard, the nard dog, until he got the nickname Boner Champ 3. It it, it kind of seems silly, and they do kind of play it as a bit of a joke, but I, I get it at the same time. High school, maybe even more so college years, because you've, you're going out independent for the first time. They're so largely formative when you start discovering yourself and defining who you're going to be for the rest of your life. So. If Andy found identity in his college a cappella group, who are we to make fun of that? But what we can make fun of is how stupid the nickname is and how he got it, which I don't think we need to go in depth about on this podcast. 
Yeah, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's not a great story, and he seems to think it is. But he also, and kind of annoyingly, very annoyingly, plays coy on this whole thing. Like, A, he brought in his college a cappella group, mm-hmm. uh, which is weird enough. And then B, it was like, oh, they might call me up to sing. Oh, me? Little old me? And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know what you're doing. Everyone else knows what you're doing. You dressed up as the, car- or as, as the singer of the song that you sang in college, George Michael. You're, you're, you're asking for this attention and I, I get, again, as you said, that it's such a formative time and it's uh, part of his identity, but it's time to graduate from college and he never seemed to have done that. That, that first revelation that, that these younger treblers think that Broccoli Rob was the boner champ really upsets him. And then later, Aaron has convinced them. She's, she's trying so hard to make this day special for Andy. She, she gets upset with him when he's upset about Here Comes Trouble, thinking boner champ was someone else. Then she goes to uh, Here Comes Trouble and says, you better do Faith. It's Andy's song. You, you need to do it. And then when they do decide to sing it during their concert that everybody is required to go to, She's just as shocked as he is when Broccoli Rob himself shows up to do what's supposed to be Andy's feature solo. Aaron says in a talking head, you know, the more I hear about all this acapella drama, the more I think it's kind of pathetic. But when you're with someone, you put up with the stuff that makes you lose respect for them. And that is love. Not entirely sure that's what love is, but I'm glad that she's trying to be the good girlfriend through it all anyways. Yeah, there's a couple of weird Andy and Aaron moments in this episode. That is one where she essentially says that she's losing respect for him. And another is when she goes to talk to the troublers, as we can call them, uh, and she tells them, you need to sing Faith. You just need to do it. Andy's going to lose it if you don't. Uh, When she leaves that room, the break room, she turns to Pete, unprompted, and says, this isn't stupid. Mm -hmm. And Pete's like, what, what, you know, like, <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. I, why are you telling me? And Aaron seems to have felt the need to justify her actions. So there's a bit of a weird dynamic here between Aaron and Andy and, but she's being very mature during this whole episode. And I have a lot of respect for her in this episode. There's not a whole lot else to say about this. I mean, those are the, the, the highlights of the Andy here comes trouble story, but there is a big revelation that comes at the end. Andy through it all. And we should mention Broccoli Rob is played by Stephen Colbert, which is a fun surprise, Mm -hmm. but Broccoli Rob has apologized. The, the here comes trouble has apologized. Andy is trying to make peace with everything. And Aaron says, you know, maybe you could just be like a mentor to these kids. That, That would, that would make you happy. And he says, you know what? I'm going to make a donation to these kids. And that turns into, I'm going to set up a scholarship for acapella kids at Cornell. And so he says, you know, I know somebody who works at the Bernard Family Foundation, good old mom. And so he calls his mom and asks about starting this, this scholarship. And the, the, the mic drops. His formerly wealthy parents are now broke. And that's all we know when the episode finishes in regards to this storyline. The next one maybe we should talk about is Jim and Pam. So Jim has this big investment lunch with the sports marketing group. So he didn't dress up for Halloween, not that he would anyway, as we know him. And from the beginning of the episode, there seems to be a bit of joking tension, but definitely tension. Pam and Jim have a talking head together, and she says, you know, the sports marketing business that Jim told everyone about, except for me, and it's sort of jokey, but there's definitely some, you know. There's some bite to it. There's some bite. And Jim says, oh, yeah, I I have a lunch. Pam says, he didn't dress up unless he has a secret costume that he told everyone else about except for me. And Jim kind of tries to play it off like, oh, you're, you're getting a lot of mileage out of this joke, aren't you? And Pam just says, yeah, get used to it because I have a lot of ammunition. <laughs> and uh, they had discussed, Jim and Pam, a number, a, a dollar amount that they were comfortable uh, investing in this company if it came to investing. They were comfortable with a certain amount of money, and that's sort of what this meeting was. So Jim shows up to this meeting, and there's a bit of tension there as well. He's not really one of the guys, as he's not in Philadelphia. He doesn't seem to be an equal partner. That is until he volunteers to, at this point, essentially donate money because the financing has been completed. They said, don't even worry about it. We're all set, Jim. And he says, no, no, no. I want to put in the full $10,000 
which was the absolute cap max that he and Pam had discussed being feasible. And okay, we'll happily take your $10,000. And they do. And now he's part of the team. I mean, he was anyway, but now he feels a part of the team. And so when he returns and Pam finds out that he just volunteered this money, which was most of their savings, she says, I mean, she is livid. I'm really curious to to learn your thoughts on this because, I don't know, I, I get where Pam's upset with Jim comes from, that he volunteered it. But if they said it was okay to put up to a certain amount, then she shouldn't be upset by Jim putting in that certain amount, in my mind. Again, I'm, I'm, I, I get Pam being upset a little bit, but it, it, it doesn't seem right for her to be as upset as she is. I will admit that Jim was quick to offer up the full amount without maybe even finding out the other's level of investment. For all he knew, maybe they all put in like $2,000 and he was just like, oh, well, here's 10. Why not? Uh, we don't know. I-, I do hate how he sort of dismisses her disapproval in the moment once he gets back because it's just a weird moment. And I, I get that a little bit too. But I mean, he he's sort of flippant with uh, Pam wanting to discuss this further in the moment. So I, I go back and forth a little bit. But what it boils down to me is they said they discussed they actually talked about this something which is a good thing since Jim hid this for so long. They talked about going up to a certain amount. And he went up to that certain amount. Yes, it's a lot. But they talked about it. And so I don't entirely understand why she's upset with as upset with him as she is i totally understand that i think they together overestimated the amount of money that they would be comfortable spending and i think when that number hit pam she kind of freaked out uh if if she wasn't truly comfortable with ten thousand dollars don't agree to ten thousand dollars i think it was irresponsible of jim to you know go in with this money when he really didn't need to. And I think that is a, is the bulk of what angers Pam. If he needed to do the $10,000, because when, when he tells her it's the 10000 she's shocked, but she's not angry. Mm-hmm. She's, wow, okay, it's the 10000 Okay, wow, uh, all right. What did everyone else donate? Or not donate, but... Um, invest. Invest, thank you. What did everyone else invest? And he... When he says, I don't know, they said that they were all in for investing. That's when she gets mad. Because he didn't need to do this. Why spend $10,000 you don't need to spend? And he goes, well, I wanted to feel a part of the team in, in different words. But basically that, I wanted to be a, be a teammate. Okay, great. You want to be a teammate. You know, don't spend our savings. And I think that's really why she's angry. Uh, you know, be a team player and donate two thousand dollars. Not donate again. Invest. Yeah. I keep I keep calling it donate because it's essentially what he's doing. He didn't need to do it. So long story short, yeah, I think that's why. Yeah, I mean, again, I get that. I'm not trying to make either of them make out to be the bad guy in this situation, but I, I still think that Jim wasn't entirely in the wrong, especially considering. He is now a founding member of this business. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't done, put in any money, then maybe projecting and projecting into the future, it would have been really easy to squeeze him out if they decided they didn't need him. Right. Uh, So him putting in a sizable investment sort of guarantees him a position at the company. So, I mean, when it comes to what Pam herself said in this episode, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. That's what Mm -hmm. it seems to me Jim was doing. So... (laughs) <laughs> we, we could go yeah. on and back and forth about this a lot, but yeah, it's uh, tricky. in any case, they are, or she is upset with him. They start discussing this right at the beginning of the concert. And so it becomes difficult to, to talk about it further in the moment. Uh, but then later they are talking with a couple of people uh, at reception, just hanging out, talking after the concert. And Pam makes it even further clear how unhappy she is about this. And uh, we can talk about that now, but I was probably going to save it for Kevin's funny moments later. So, yeah, I mean, Jim is taking big steps in this company. Pam is happy or maybe not happy. She tolerates some of them and other of them she is still not so keen on. And giving away $10,000, she's not too keen on. 
So moving on to Dwight, he finds a pill on the floor, and it's a Dumatril, which is an anti-anxiety pill. Uh, and he takes this to mean that there is a madman at Dunder Mifflin. He takes it upon himself to find out who this deranged person is. So he does this by yelling, Dumatril, at the top of his lungs in the office to see kind of who, <laughs> who would respond. And Nellie turns to Dwight and asks what's wrong. And Nellie insists that really none of this is Dwight's concern, right? It's just an, it's an anxiety pill. It's not illicit drugs, right? And so Dwight, of course, takes this as Nellie covering something up. We learn in a talking head that this is Nellie's pill. And she says, I have an anxiety issue. I'm not ashamed of that. But this isn't Dwight's business. In fact, I saw him yelling at Phyllis once for sneezing wrong. So I don't really want him uh, all up in my business. So she thinks that the best way to deter Dwight from thinking it's her is to team up with him. So they spend the day trying to catch this madman. But over the course of the day, Nellie kind of proves herself as a really sane person. And when she finally tells Dwight that it's her pill, I think there's this switch that goes off in his head. Well, first he tells her, you don't think I have anxiety too? I have anxiety all the time. Every waking moment of my life is sheer torture. He says, I have lay on disputes. I've got to settle an idiot cousins to protect and siblings to take care of, but I don't need pills to take care of this. Again, I think that this switch flips and he sees that Nellie is a normal person who copes with anxiety healthily and she takes prescription medication to deal with that. And he decides that this is something that might help him as well. I love this. I, I, I think it's great that the office took a moment to, to maybe sort of address and normalize mental health. Nellie herself says, it, it doesn't mean that I'm crazy. It just means that I have anxiety and this makes me feel better. And when Dwight does admit that he has anxiety all the time and that every moment of his life is sheer torture, she says, hey, maybe it could help you too. And there's that moment between them at the end when Dwight goes up to her and says, hey, I would like some, some of these. I mean, my cousin Mose would like some of these pills as well. And so, yeah, he's hiding it under the guise of his, quote, cousin Mose. But it's nice to see Dwight, who once told us that he could raise and lower his cholesterol at will, admit that he's struggling and that the pills would help him. So it, it's Dwight taking ownership by not taking ownership, if that makes sense. He, he's not admitting autonomy over all of his body anymore. He's saying, this would help me to regulate myself. And so I, I really like that. I think it's great that The Office even took a, a small C plot in an episode to address something like this. And then maybe the last thing to mention uh, for, for this episode, character development-wise, is that Angela brings her husband, the senator, to the Halloween party. And uh, there's definite tension between Oscar and the senator. And th there's definitely some friendliness and some looks. But Oscar indicates with his eyes that the cameras are watching, so they think better of it. But later in the parking lot, we see the two of them kissing. And afterwards, Oscar sees what the camera has seen. And we just get this look of, oh, crap. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's the last we see of that. Okay, so before we get full on into funny moments, let's talk about all the costumes. Uh, Pam yeah. is Dr. Cinderella because Cece's really into princesses and they wanted to come up with one that's a, a role model <laughs> for her. Uh, it's worth noting that I think this episode is right before Frozen came out, like literally like right before. And also before Moana and both of those featured strong princess characters that weren't necessarily problematic. <laughs> mm. And then just a couple more before I let you say some. Meredith is a surprisingly good Black Widow. <laughs> this is hot off the release of The Avengers that came out that year. Uh, Kevin is a really good Charlie Brown. <laughs> and Angela is a really good Nancy Reagan, <laughs> along with her husband being Ronald, but he has to have a mask. Uh, so yeah, some really impressive costumes this year. Aaron is a puppy, not a dog. <laughs> it's funny that she was confused to be a dog just like Andy was confused to be a kitten rather than a uh, or a cat rather than a kitten yeah. <laughs> uh, back yeah, in season a, five a parallel uh Andy as I said was George Michael Oscar is a dinosaur or the electoral college as he jokes to Robert <laughs> how apropos for the cult current cultural climate yeah honestly uh, Phyllis is a cheerleader. Dwight is wearing a pig nose. Nellie is sexy Toby, and we'll get into that in a bit. <laughs> and then a couple of just background ones that weren't really addressed. Daryl is in some like Western clothing. 
And Stanley, I think, is an Olympic runner. I think he's supposed to be Usain Bolt. Yeah, I think so. Because this was right after the 2012 Summer Olympics. Yeah. It's funny that Dwight was simply dressed in a pig snout for the main episode because in the cold open, we saw maybe what his costume was going to be and it didn't really work out for him. He has carved out a jack-o'-lantern. Uh, he's carved the face into it and then has hollowed out the insides and cut a hole in the bottom and placed it over his head just so he could get like two seconds of scaring Aaron. And right after that happens, he realizes, oh no, this thing is stuck on my head. And no, nothing that they have tried is successful in taking it off. Anything suggested seems like it might also like decapitate him, like detate his kappa from his head. Um, And I don't know if my favorite shot of this cold open is pumpkin dwight casually strolling into the office for work (laughs) or pumpkin dwight slowly like rumbling off cautiously after being threatened by jim with a bat (laughs) with warehouse clapping in the background (laughs) and uh or pumpkin dwight forlornly just sitting all alone in the break room (laughs) like that's such a great shot of them from like a distance looking at him yeah a lot of good ones (laughs) he just consigns to the fact that the pumpkin would eventually rot off right hopefully so he just lets it lets it be Mm -hmm. moving on to some other funny moments andy after here comes trouble sings for the first time when they enter the office dwight is disgusted he says what lab did these little clones come from (laughs) and andy says my cornell acapella group pam jokes You were in an acapella group, and even better, Daryl jokes, you went to Cornell. (laughs) (laughs) It was so great. So quick to to act off of Pam's initial. And then later, during the concert, one of the Here Comes Trouble kids says, there's a former trebler in this room. And Daryl just goes, who? (laughs) (laughs) Who? There's such a simple thing that is really funny. It's Dwight eating the nerds, and he tells Aaron that these are gyms. I mean, I'm eating little gyms because they're nerds and gyms are nerd. And it's such a lame joke. So it's hilarious that it makes sweet Aaron laugh so hard. She like runs off needing to use the bathroom because she's laughing so hard. It like really gets her. Yeah, it's such a simple joke. It's not that funny, but I mean, it's Aaron. So, so this is one of my all time favorite Creed moments ever. Uh, Pete says that he didn't realize that everyone dresses up this year. Oops, I didn't dress up. Creed goes, yeah, me neither. And he looks at him funny because Creed is wearing regular office clothing that has been splattered with blood. It looks like, you know, a pretty normal Halloween costume, you know, just kind of an easy ad. There's a Creed talking head right after that. He says, it's Halloween. That is really, really good timing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Which means that... If it wasn't Halloween, he would have just shown up to the office having done something with blood uh, (laughs) as if no one would notice. Yeah. So Aaron, speaking to our discomfort and saying the word boner, (laughs) has a moment towards the end of the episode where she's talking with Andy and she says, well, um, you know, maybe you're the wise old guy that the new, uh, hmm. B-O-N-E-R, champ looks up to. (laughs) She's just like, yeah, I'm not going to say that word. You can say say it it. all you want, but I am (laughs) going to refrain. (laughs) Clark, during the Here Comes Trouble set, he is so overly dramatic. He's like, wait, 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 hold on. Where's the band? Because there is no way you guys are making all this magic with just your mouths. And Creed under his breath says that. That's what she said. (laughs) And then, (laughs) which is so funny. I don't think we've ever heard him make one. And then Clark, right after that, has a talking head. He says, am I overdoing it? No, 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 no. And then even (laughs) later, we see Clark just standing and clapping along with the group and dancing. And he's like the only one besides Creed or besides Andy. He's actually enjoying this. (laughs) Yeah. And Andy like turns around and is like cheering at Clark as well. He's like, yeah, I'm glad you're so into this. At the very (laughs) beginning of the episode, when they first showed up, uh, Clark just blatantly says, I love the boss's interests. <laughs> like, that's so non committal. <laughs> and like Andy just says, add a boy, Clark. <laughs> Whatever he likes, I like. Broccoli Rob has a funny line that I don't know if I'd ever caught before. He says, Champ, I feel off about this whole thing. Russell called me up and they said they needed 20 cc's of George Michael stat. So just wham, I spring into action. For those who didn't catch the joke I just said, <laughs> <laughs> wham was the name of George Michael's group. That saying like jitterbug and 
Yeah. Or wake me up before you go, go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if I caught it before, but it's really funny. Yeah. That's, it's a sly, very subtle joke. It's, and it all just on the subject of Broccoli Rob, it always makes me wonder when they use like high profile cameos like this, does like Stephen Colbert not exist in this timeline? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, do they not watch the Colbert rapport, which was going on at this point in time? Uh, it's just a funny thought to me. Like, Hey, he looks like, nope. <laughs> so this whole Nellie thing Ugh. Nellie's costume was sexy Toby and when she shows Toby her costume he he's speechless he cannot believe it he loves it so much he might love her so much uh, and he leans in to kiss her and she's just not into it she kind of just backs away and Toby runs away later we see Toby has brought flowers for Nellie and when she removes her wig, her Toby, you know, receding hairline wig and lets her hair down, he looks at her differently. His posture kind of changes. And then he leaves the room and we see him banging the flowers on the wall and throwing them in the trash, which is just like Freud would have a field day. Like I have no <laughs> idea what is in his head, but. Well, um, let's have a field day because I'm going to interject with my discussion topic. <laughs> because yes, do it. My discussion topic is WTF is up with Toby. <laughs> is, is he, I'm going to posit a few options. Is he attracted to Nelly? Is he attracted to Nelly dressed up as himself? Is he attracted to the idea of a woman dressing up as him? <laughs> <laughs> any woman <laughs> any of the any of the above ah. is is he flattered by this like what is going on in his head i mean him smashing the flowers against the wall after she takes off the hair piece kind of says a little bit about it but it's like uh, i don't know <laughs> so i i thought he was attracted to nelly right yeah he'd sort of come onto her once or twice right yeah i believe that had happened that he just sort of thought she was attractive and whatever and then the fact that she took the time and the effort to dress up as him, maybe that was a flirtatious move. But then it's like he's so disappointed and so uh, just turned off, essentially, by seeing her as a woman and not seeing her as him. Oh, I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> Is it like... I'm the only other. Um, I'm the only person I ever trusted. I, I had such bad success with women that I, maybe if I could end up with myself, that'd be <laughs> ideal. Like, what is going? On? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I, I I think he can no longer be attracted to Nelly. I think after after seeing her as as him and then seeing her as her, he's like that. That's it. That closes that chapter. I don't know. I don't know. I would I, hope I don't so. Know. He any, needs to not. Any psychologist or psychiatrist out there, hit us up because I want I want some answers. Is this a thing? Do, is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyways, let's move on. A couple please. more funny moments. <laughs> um, Dwight goes up to Daryl um, in the kitchen with Nellie. They're they're sleuthing, trying to find who this pill belongs to, who the crazy person in the office is. And so Dwight comes up to Daryl with the idea that smearing peanut butter on your face will protect you from the nanobots the government put in the air conditioning. Daryl says, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time picturing it. Put, put some up here. And so Dwight puts a little peanut butter on his forehead. And Dwight says, oh, is this making sense to you? <laughs> and so Daryl says, uh, get the cheeks. Oh, yeah, under the chin. Oh, yeah, wipe it up to your lip. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and he walks off. So he lets Dwight smear peanut butter all over his face before he will admit to him. Yeah, that's crazy. I think maybe my last one is during the concert. We see Dwight kind of in focus through the out of focus singers, right? And he's just staring at the camera in the corner with his hands, his fingers in his ears, just glaring like i don't want to be part of any of this i hate music and he just stares down the camera until it's over <laughs> he just hates this so much he looks miserable i've got just a couple small kevin moments the first is when he says i decided that acapelka music is awesome <laughs> not how you say that word but then the the thing we w alluded to earlier is the monster mash discussion oh yes um angela says you know, they lost me when they sang Monster Mash because that song obviously glorifies the occult. And Jim's response is, Angela, it's Halloween. You have to sing Monster Mash. And so that turns into this big back and forth argument between Jim and Pam where she says, oh, you have to, Jim. You literally have to. 
I'm just saying, what would happen if they didn't sing it? Would they go to jail? Would they be shot? I'm interested. I mean, I think everybody's interested in why they have to sing it. And so it, it goes back and forth, and uh, it, it's just the same points we were making earlier. But then Kevin has a talking head. He's there for this discussion. He says, it turns out that Pam really, really hates Monster Mash. I mean, like, never bring that song up in front of her. Even though Jim was making great points, like, in favor of the song, Pam was like, no, hate it, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like... Uh, Andy being privy to Pam and Jim's discussion o- over Pam's dad leaving during the movie with Jack Black and Cloris Leachman back in season yeah. five, I think. It's like the same, like they are extrapolating the wrong thing from this conversation. <laughs> yeah. We get some additional Dwight in a pumpkin head bits. Dwight waves goodnight to Aaron, who tells her to be careful. Uh, and then Dwight is reversing his car as he's leaving the office and he overshoots and ends up hitting the curb behind him. And this ends up cracking the pumpkin and he's able to remove it from his head. And he is just elated. He's also kind of sweaty and <laughs> he's just like, <laughs> yes. And he just throws it out the window and speeds off. I kind of wish they had included that in the, like found a way to put those two or five extra seconds in the episode, just so that we had some sort of explanation as to how he got the pumpkin off his head. Yeah. Uh, or, or like threw in a throwaway line somewhere. But in any case, the deleted scene's really funny. Yeah. Uh, next deleted scene, Andy brings Here Comes Trouble to the break room and he says, yeah, we've got loads of snacks and shiz in here. And if you want anything, just ask because I've got bags and bags of quarters. And he says, about you guys singing Faith. You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, Broccoli Rob and me made it a rule that alumni don't influence set lists for a reason. And then one of the members speaks up and says, oh, you were, you were in the group with Broccoli Rob? And he says, yeah, learn your history. At this point, Aaron walks in, says, hey, there's a phone call for you. A client didn't receive their shipment. And Andy says, ugh, you guys never leave college because the real world is more boring than the baseline to red, red wine. And they all laugh at it, including Aaron, but I don't think she understood. <laughs> and then Andy lingers just a little bit too long on the whole acapella humor. He sings that acapella humor and everybody's uncomfortable. And then he leaves. So he like ruins his decent joke by pointing out that it was a joke. You know, that's just, yeah, yeah, you were ahead. Quit. Acapella humor. Inside stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Pam advises Nellie that she should just tell Dwight that the pill is Creed's and, you know, everyone would believe that. Uh, But Nellie said she won't do that. And then she says, Something kind of crude. Uh, she says, this is, this is my thing. And then uh, she says something kind of crude. And Pam looks down and says, th- that's what she said. And uh, <laughs> Pam suggests that Nellie just do what Pam does for Cece. She lets Cece just kind of tire herself out. When she gets into something, just let her tire herself out. Nellie says, wow, great story, Pam. And your daughter's great. But I'm a little bit more concerned with what's going on with me right now. <laughs> and Pam gives her this look like, uh, think. And Nellie realizes that, oh, you know, I could do that with Dwight. You snuck a little bit of advice into that boring story. <laughs> Pam's like, it's not that long. I just said CC. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Pete, during the party, says to the others, uh, so we don't have to work all afternoon, huh? We should have parties all the time. And Stanley says, we do. It's crazy. <laughs> and so <laughs> then at this point, Dwight and Nellie come up and ask about mental illness. He says, hey, was, were any of you just talking about it? We, we just were just talking about it, about how we're fine with it. And, you know, uh, my dog told me just this morning to kill the president. Did anyone else's dog tell them to do something? <laughs> and so he starts flashing like a pen light in Pete's face right up against his eye. And so he goes off to find Clark. And then Dwight starts doing it to Stanley. And he's like, oh, hell no. And he walks off. And so then he has Nellie go to the light switch for the conference room and start flickering it. And Dwight shines the pen light in Kevin's eye. And Kevin doesn't really react. He answers Dwight's questions for him pretty easily. And so Dwight dismisses him and says, you're not crazy. Enjoy the party. And Kevin says, thanks, you too. And so while Dwight and Nellie go to confront Phyllis next, Kevin makes his way out of the conference room, but he walks into the door frame on his way out. It's like he was temporarily blinded or uh, his center was... I, I don't know. It was just like they, they messed with his vision. Yeah. We learn that Here Comes Trouble is staying with Aaron and Andy. 
they don't live together. Aaron is in a studio apartment and Aaron says, yeah, hosting the guys in my studio apartment has been no problem. They took the bed, the couch and the floor and I slept in my desk chair. She says, my neck and my butt are killing me, but whatever, you've got to love, here comes trouble. Oh, She's yeah. like making herself a fangirl for this thing that she does not care about. So in the episode, we cut to something else after Broccoli Rob interrupts the Faith solo. And so we get an extended version of that in the deleted scene. Andy explains to Here Comes Trouble and to everyone present, here's the deal. I was a soloist on Faith and I was the boner champ. And Aaron says, because he made love to that poor snowman, okay? (laughs) And Andy says, what I did was not make love, okay? I banged that snowman into a puddle. There was nothing left but a carrot and a wet scarf. It was hilarious, and I was a hero. I I, I guess we ended up going into how I got the nickname anyways. Yeah, there it is. I I, I don't know what the counter's at now, but it's still too many. It's at seven. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I'm glad you actually kept count. I have a tally. (laughs) Oh, seven and a half. You you did spill it. Oh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but then at this point, Broccoli Rob butts back in. He says, hey, guys, the audio cut out on my end. But fellas, I felt like I knocked that one out of the park. You're welcome. <laughs> and so Andy leaves. On their way out of the conference room, one of the singers from Here Comes Trouble asks Aaron, hey, after all of that stuff that just went down, can we still stay with you tonight? And Aaron is kind of hesitant. She's like, look, I don't know. My back is falling apart. And then she catches herself. She says, you know what? I'm just complaining. I'll see what I can do. Oh, you're sleeping in a desk chair. (laughs) You don't need this. In a studio apartment. Uh, Angela is scorning Phyllis for putting brownies and ginger snaps on the same plate. She says, where's the logic here? What what was going through your mind? Phyllis says, you know, I just thought it was a party and I didn't think anyone would think too much about it. Angela says, that's ridiculous. This is what happens when I give you a long leash, but you're not getting within a mile of the snack's tail for the Christmas party. And Phyllis uh, isn't really putting up a fight. Uh, she says, I understand. I, I feel bad about this. Maybe uh, cupcakes with ginger snaps. Angela says, no, nothing should be with the ginger snaps. Ginger snaps are off-putting to some people. I like ginger snaps for the record. And she says, maybe you shouldn't be in charge of arranging the snacks. To which Phyllis says, don't go there, sweetie. Don't you go there. And Angela says, do your job. And this whole time, the camera's wandering. So in the background, we catch Robert making a sort of suggestive face at Oscar across the room before walking out of the office. And Oscar sort of struggles for a minute whether to follow him out or not, glancing back and forth between the door, Angela, and the camera. And of course, he ends up following him and and hence the end of the episode. Yep. The band, choir, acapella group? whatever you want to call him, asks Andy this time if they can stay with him because Meredith has offered to let them stay with her, but they don't feel too great about that. And we pan over to see Meredith just zipping and unzipping her shirt. Mm. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And they apologize about earlier and they ask what they can do to make up for it. And Andy says, you know what? You can be young and enjoy life and have fun before it all crashes down on your head and destroys everything you know. And of course, this is moments after he heard about his family's uh, misfortune. Yeah. After Nellie confesses that it was her pill all along, this is in the kitchen, Dwight says, you know, as defender of this office, I will be notifying everyone else. I'll be delivering a public statement about your mental status. And Aaron interrupts and says, the concert's starting. And he continues, immediately after the mandatory college acapella concert, prepare to be stigmatized. So Nellie's left there worrying. And later, Dwight stands up from his desk in the main office. And he tells everyone, I have an announcement to make. And we, and Nellie, assume that it's to expose her. But he says, the announcement is that this Halloween party is fairly average. Of the 12 that I've been to, this is the seventh best. That is all. Angela's obviously pissed. And Kevin just says, whatever. And walks (laughs) off like, "You you could have gone without telling us that. And that ends with a talking head from Dwight saying, Nellie may be crazy, but who among us isn't crazy? Me. Just me. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one, uh, we get a dialogue on the Nellie Toby flowers scene that we didn't have dialogue in the episode. She asks him who the flowers are for as she takes off her wig, and he says, nobody. And then that's when he slams them on the wall and throws them away. And then there's a Toby talking head. He says, I was just kidding around. Happy Halloween. And he sniffs like he's holding back tears. So yeah, he's a weird dude, but we knew that. 
Let's move on to The Boat, our next episode of discussion. It aired on November 8th, 2012. It was directed by John Krasinski and written by Dan Sterling. Andy has become the man of the family now that his father has blown the family fortune and run off to Argentina with the younger woman. And he's being surprisingly really competent and mature about handling everything. But he struggles to sell the boat that has been in the family for years. Dwight prepares for a phone interview as a representative from Dunder Mifflin, and Kevin learns Oscar's big secret. Pam and Jim start this episode off. Uh, They talk a little bit about how his dad blew through all their money, took off with a younger woman. Walt Jr., the famed, prized older brother, or younger brother, rather, sorry, uh, locked himself in a wine cellar. And Andy, who everyone kind of expected to just become a mess, is stepping up. And he's being competent, and uh, that's kind of surprised everyone. He has his talking heads. He says, are the Nards hurting? Yeah, you bet. Got kicked pretty hard. Family shattered. Super sad. But I'm kind of crushing it in the damage control department. <laughs> he's, sp- he's speaking really quickly. Like, he's just, if he stops, he'll crash, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. And he says, so cool. I, 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 I wish my dad could see me now. Of course, he's the one that caused this mess, so bleep him. <laughs> I'm sure that there's some feelings there because his dad never... Uh, believed in him and never trusted him and now he's the one holding the family together just barely so andy calls oscar and aaron and daryl into the conference room to help strategize a plan for his family's finances and they decide that selling the boat would mean financial security for andy's mom but he is very nostalgic about this boat he has ties to it when he can sail the boat he is a man and he's never sailed the boat And so that's really telling that he does not consider himself a full-grown adult man because of this weird nostalgia with this boat. So he has a really hard time deciding to sell it. Uh, Without selling it, though, his mom would be taken care of for only about six months, and uh, he still cannot bring himself to sell it. A line I wrote in my notes that I laughed at that I just want to share with everybody because (laughs) why not? Because Chad Um, was proud of himself. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So he's at first willing to sell everything but the family boat, but then even gives that up despite it being the responsible thing to do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I mean, he, he explains further and you touched on this as well. He was never allowed to sail it, not until he was a man, which I'm assuming his father had an argument against all the way into Andy's adulthood because he is a jerk bag. And so Aaron is through all of this, trying to be the supportive girlfriend through a tough time. And she at a moment wears goofy teeth to cheer him up and says, you know, this, this isn't how I would cheer up just anyone. It's a girlfriend's job to know her man. And I know Andy and he's seriously juvenile. And Andy's actually not amused by him because uh, it's almost as if this whole situation has made him grow up a bit. So again, kind of good for him. Um, And then Aaron says, you know what, if this boat means that much to you and sailing it really elevates yourself in your head, it's going to make you feel better about everything, then let's go. Like, let's do it. You've been so responsible about all of this other stuff. You've been working so hard to take care of things. Take a moment for yourself. Go to the boat. Sail it like you've wanted to do all this time. And let's go. I'll go with you. And so Andy does they, they they go together to the boat and they're originally just going to take it for a, a quick ride have a picnic somewhere but the guy loading the the boat won't let him do that and so eventually Aaron says you know what whether we go sailing or not you are still the captain in my eyes and he says you know what i am the captain and as captain that means he's in charge he gets to do what he wants to do and so he he tells the loading crew you know what i am taking this to the bahamas where it, which is its next destination, myself. I'm going to take it myself. And he finds his brother hidden on board. Uh, He has escaped from rehab, apparently. And the two of them set off on this adventure to the Bahamas to discover themselves and to spend these last days with the family boat before it's not in their possession ever again. And to to clean up uh, Walter Jr. from being addicted to alcohol this however long. And it's great that Aaron has encouraged Andy to do something like this, but she is not as psyched as Andy is at the end of the day because Andy didn't invite her to go with him to the Bahamas, even though she was the one who inspired him to do it. So bummer for her, but Andy is taking a big step in fulfilling this long desire he's had for himself, I guess. 
And the last Aaron thing is when she comes back to the office and she's noticeably dejected. She's not her usual bubbly self. Pete, who's been covering the phones, invites her out for drinks with his friends and she accepts, which is something she may not have done if, if uh, the day she had 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 not just happened. It doesn't appear to be a romantic or a date or anything, but we have talked about how Pete and Aaron have been getting along really well. And so when Andy did not invite her somewhere, Pete did. Mm -hmm. And so whatever does happen, I'm not going to say it's Andy's fault, but it's a missed opportunity on his part for sure. Now, Oscar is our next big plot line here. And I'm going to talk about the cold open because while there are humorous bits, it's, uh, it's really about Oscar here. So... Oscar asks the camera crew if he can have a minute alone with them, and he tells them in a talking head that he knows that they saw him with the senator, kissing. He tells them that he thinks he's in love, probably for the first time, and he tells them that they're having an affair. So, as he's telling them this, they're outside, and Kevin appears from behind some wooden pallets with an ice cream cone, and he has heard everything. And Kevin drops his ice cream, and Oscar just turns around, pained, and just says, why (laughs) so kevin learns the secret remember of course that oscar kevin and angela all share very tight quarters in the accounting corner and uh they're in a desk clump so two of the three people know the secret and kevin is one of them so he's having a very hard time holding it together and anytime Angela or Oscar speaks Kevin is just brimming with laughter like he's about to burst he just can't handle it And uh, Oscar eventually gets so nervous that he goes to Toby with something that Kevin supposedly did regarding the numbers, something unsavory. And we hear Toby say that, okay, this clearly is not a mistake. This is something that Kevin did. Maybe his gambling addiction resurfaced. It sounds like Kevin is stealing. Kevin will have to be sent home until Toby can do a further investigation. But right as Toby has called in Kevin to send him home to uh to suspend him uh oscar interrupts and sends kevin out and tells toby that kevin is innocent that he was mad at kevin and retaliated and then the senator walks in and uh because he got the feeling that someone he loved needed a little of his attention today and that's directed toward angela but everyone knows that uh he's talking about oscar and he hugs angela and he tells oscar that he's looking healthy he puts his hand on oscar's shoulder and oscar just climbs out of his skin i mean he is like i I, it's too much i can't handle it and don't be here you know and angela's very weirded out and she asks oscar what that was all about but kevin actually is the one to save the day because it sounds like at that moment like oscar is gonna let his own secret out but kevin says oscar we're not just gonna sit here and pretend like we don't know what's going on senator lipton has a big election we've all got to support him And Oscar is just relieved. Like, how is it that Kevin, who knew this secret, (laughs) is the one to save me here? There are several moments in the episode where Kevin nearly gives up the secret. Uh, We can maybe talk about those later because they are all pretty funny. The trying to set Kevin up to get in trouble with Toby thing is so uncharacteristic of Oscar. And I'm glad he, he changes his mind about it and confesses. But Kevin... Yeah, he's not the most trustworthy person when it comes to keeping a secret, but he does manage to pull through here. Uh, The important thing is that Kevin is trying and he is worried about giving the secret away. That's the big takeaway here. And he is successful. And there at the very end, when he almost gives it away, he says, I completely forgot about the affair for a minute. But then he exposes even further what's wrong in this situation. Oscar is having sex with a senator. And Angela doesn't even know. And he says her life is a complete sham, which he says it while laughing. But I mean, really, it's kind of like a dire situation. There's lots of things that parallel previous seasons so far in season nine. And this definitely parallels Andy not knowing about the affair between Dwight and Angela. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just like the time is ticking until something is going to happen. And we know it's probably not going to be pretty when it does. One specific line I wanted to highlight from Oscar at the end, after Kevin has successfully kept the secret with Robert in the office. Oscar compliments Kevin in a talking head. He says, Kevin showed a lot of self-control. It's just like, man, the irony of that statement is so intense because obviously somebody was not able to exercise self-control in the situation. Yeah. Let's mention the Toby bit in this episode. It's not something we need to linger on for a long time. But when Oscar admits that he falsified the reports that incriminated Kevin, Toby says, I, I knew it. 
I knew it from the beginning it was possible. And he explains, he's not referring to Oscar and to Kevin. He's referring to the Scranton Strangler, who he thinks was innocent and was framed. And so apparently Toby is thinking that he sent an, an, an innocent man to death row. So that's an interesting development. We haven't heard anything about the Scranton Strangler. I guess the last time he was mentioned was the episode where Jim was in jury duty. But before that, it was like season five or whatever it was. I get the feeling, though, that the office has heard a lot about this because when he says, no, the Scranton Strangler, Oscar gets this look like, oh, of course, of course, it's the Scranton Strangler. Like, why? Why wouldn't it be? It's Um, like the one thing that makes Toby interesting. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And he's played it out. And he knows it. So there's another storyline here that is very, very funny. So we can use that as sort of a transition. Pam gets a call that there is a radio show called BizWiz that wants somebody from Dunder Mifflin to come on the show and Dwight volunteers as a strong salesman, as the lead salesman, he volunteers to do this. He's annoying everyone so much with this. He's doing these annoying tongue twisters loudly. He's, he's just taking this way too seriously. And while Dwight is out of the room, the radio show called and canceled, but Jim, Pam, and Nellie decide that it would be more fun to not tell Dwight that it had been canceled and to conduct the interview themselves. And so Dwight is in one room, the three of them are in another, with Daryl as well. And uh, they all put on these voices. Pam, you know, please hold for Ms. Black. And uh, Iris Black is played by Nellie in this amazing (laughs) American radio host voice. And uh, it starts out as a pretty normal interview and it escalates into the... Of course, again, this is all fake, but the share prices for Dunder Mifflin going way down and like David Wallace taking a hostage and like all of this <laughs> crazy stuff. And it just is exhausting, like the amount of work and the amount of drama. And uh, Dwight is just so panicked. It's so great. They, they convince him pretty early on to take off his shirt and pants. And so he's just wearing his underwear in the break room as he's uh, going through with his interview. And speaking of the, the David Wallace hostage situation, Dwight says, hold on a second. I have David's phone number. I can call him. And so he actually calls David Wallace. And the ones in the conference room start to panic at this point because, oh, what if he what if, what if it's revealed this is a prank and we get in big trouble for it? And so Dwight calls David and says, I just want you to know that I believe in you. I really do. And, and I believe in your ability to make the right choices. I always have, David. But, but David, listen to me carefully. I'm going to need you to let the mailman go, okay? Walk, walk out of the house with your hands on top of your head. Everything is going to be fine. Dunder Mifflin will be in good hands while you're away in prison. And David's just like, what the heck, Dwight? Never call my cell phone again. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) And so after this is said and done, Dwight trudges back into the main office carrying his pants with him and everybody starts applauding. And so he thinks he saved the day and everyone else is just thankful that their deception wasn't exposed. And uh, Dwight finishes this this storyline with overall, I'd say my first radio interview went pretty much the way I expected. (laughs) Like, okay. I also love that it was Dwight that call David Wallace with this weird, you know, let the hostages go. Because if it was pretty much anyone else, David might have like suspected that something was up. But he just thinks it was Dwight being like, don't call my phone. (laughs) Don't do this. (laughs) But, you know, if it was Jim making this phone call or something, it would be a huge deal. Like something's wonky. This is either a prank or there is something crazy happening. (laughs) It's like Dwight telling Charles Minor back in season five and the Michael Scott Paper Company episodes that they were broke and which was true. But because it was Dwight, Charles thought it was crazy and he had become fed up with Dwight at this point. So, yeah, it's like opposite sides of the same behavior of Dwight. Mm -hmm. Like it has its advantages and disadvantages. So other funny moments. Dwight talking about preparing for this phone interview. He says the media can make you famous. And do you have any idea how easy it is to sell something when you're famous? Uh, Yeah. Wow. Ten reams of 40 pound bond at only 690 after discount. Um, whatever you say, Brad Pitt, it's that easy. (laughs) Kevin has a lot of ammunition in this episode. He's got some great lines. When Oscar asks Kevin, can you keep my secret? Kevin says, I really want to. Whatever happens, always remember that. (laughs) 
Oscar's like, no, I no, I don't know what that means. I need an answer from you. <laughs> and Angela uh, is at the copier. We could just go through all of these real quick. Yeah. Angela's at the copier. She says, man, jammed. This day couldn't get any worse. And Kevin laughs and says, yeah, I, I think this day could get worse. And it just says, what does that mean? And Oscar has overheard from the conference room while he's helping Andy with his assets. And Oscar just shouts, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin says, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and just sort of like thumbs up Oscar from behind Angela. She's very confused because she has no idea what's happening. Angela starts giving Kevin a hard time about something else. And she says, I don't know why I'm surprised. Literally nothing you do could surprise me anymore. And Kevin in front of Oscar, bets Angela that there is something he could do to surprise her, and he's getting really excited, and he seems to be about to tell Angela, and then Oscar kind of, like, makes a sound to, like, warn him, and Kevin catches on, and he just loudly says, I have to go to the bathroom! <laughs> and Angela says, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> what did I say? And then there's an Oscar talking head. He says, that actually wasn't the worst cover. I'd say at least once a week, Kevin runs out of the room shouting that he has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and we see several examples, my favorite of which is Kevin like waving to everyone by at the end of the day. He's pulling out in his car and then he slams on their brakes and runs out of this car back to the office because he has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's so great. Then the last one in the episode is when Angela says the senator is exhausted. The campaign is wearing him out. Oscar says, that's a tough one. Angela says, that man he's up against is so dirty. And the senator's just pushing back as hard as he can. And Kevin, the camera looks at him and he's like straining and he looks like in physical pain. He says, please stop. Angela says, what? Kevin just says, please stop. Angela says, anyways, last night he was tired and just wanted a little Mexican brought in. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin laughs, stands up and he says, I can't, it's too much. I can't do it. <laughs> And right after that is even better. Oscar has a talking head. He says, I'm in big trouble. And then Kevin has his own talking head. He says, yeah, Oscar's in big trouble. <laughs> totally <laughs> like, straight I, face. Yeah. Like, I can't I, do this. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe my last one, uh, when Aaron and Andy get to the boat, Aaron is blown away. She goes, Andy, this is beautiful. That's yours. It's enormous. I thought it was going to be a tiny boat. And she says, wow, so this is how your family came to America. <laughs> I mean, it's a big boat, but it's not that big. <laughs> no. And also, I have a feeling that Andy's family, uh, many, many generations of Americans. Right, yeah. They've probably been here for a while. Yeah. There's a moment. So I already talked about how Dwight was stripped down to his underwear during the phone interview. And there's a moment where to get Kevin away from Toby, Oscar gives Kevin a couple of dollars to go to the vending machines. And Kevin says, oh, classy move. And so he, he goes to the vending machines and finds Dwight in his underwear on the phone. And he just sort of stares for a second. But then the next time we cut into the break room, we see Kevin in the background <laughs> dressed down to his underwear, <laughs> eating his snacks just because, hey, I guess that's the thing to do today <laughs> is to strip down to your underwear to eat or to hang out in the break room. Uh, so there's that. And then one last small moment is from Creed. At the very beginning of the episode, Pam says, hey, guys, anyone ever heard of Iris Black on the radio? And Creed says, yeah, she hosts the Dr. Laura show. Pam says, no, that's Dr. Laura. <laughs> oh, that's Dr. Laura. We also had many deleted scenes for this episode. Andy's on the phone with his mother, convincing her that she won't have to sleep in a boxcar because that's not what hobos do anymore. Andy asks, are hobos still even a thing? Is that what we call them? Disclosure, it is not what we call them. <laughs> no. Aaron has a talking head. She says, it's hard finding the right way to be there for a loved one when his family lost millions of dollars. I googled younger women, dad, brother, drunk hobo, mom, and it linked me to John Voigt's Kickstarter account. So I'm helping him get a Panda Express now. I just wish I could help Andy too. <laughs> and during this, this voiceover, she's passing around a basket in the office for money. John Voigt, for those who are not aware, uh, is one Angelina Jolie's father. And a prolific actor in his own accord. You might recognize him most from the National Treasure movies or what I immediately think of him as. Because uh, he's Nicolas Cage's dad in those movies. Yeah. I didn't know he was Angelina Jolie's father. Yeah. They had an estranged relationship for a long time. Hmm. But I think they were both in the Tomb Raider movies together. So uh, he's also a crazy person. So, well, <laughs> uh. Given the Google search, I would imagine so. Yeah. There's an Aaron talking head after her whole watermelon teeth thing. She says, okay, well, now I have absolutely no idea what to do. And she whips out a sock puppet. She says, Aaron, you've got to give me a shot. She says, stop it. 
She, sh- she shoves the, the puppet down and she apologizes for the puppet's behavior. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> There's a terrifying Stanley scene. Oh my gosh. Uh, I yes. don't know where this came from, but here it is, everybody. He says to Dwight, as Dwight is leaving the, the main office for the interview in the break room, he says, hey, tell Iris Black that Stanley Hudson says hello. And so he has a talking head, Stanley. He says, Iris Black has not responded to any of my fan letters, but I know that she reads them. If you're watching this, Iris, I'm your number one fan. And it's super creepy. Like, where did that come from? What is, is it? Is he implying that he's some sort of weird stalker? I, I don't know. It is really weird. I'm just so stares glad. down the camera like yeah. with the biggest eyes. It's the weirdest thing. It is so weird. Every once in a while, there's a deleted scene where I'm just like, yes, I'm so glad they left that out. And That's this a is whole one of them. different. Yeah. That would have been like Stanley is the Scranton Strangler <laughs> theories. Like had that made it, that would have been a, a theory, I swear. We should put that theory out there anyways. Yes. Because why not? Do your work, listeners. <laughs> uh, there's a Dwight talking head that he uh, says that voice frequency indicates where you stand on the food chain. Predator. Prey. Predator that can pass as prey. That's where you want to be. <laughs> and that's his regular voice. I'm so glad that the back and forth of these deleted scenes has led me to having this one. Because I will tell you, <laughs> I have not laughed this hard at a deleted scene in a very long time. So this is more of the interview uh, shenanigans. So Pam has Nellie as Iris bring up Jim as a superstar salesman. She says, hey, l- hey, Dwight, let's talk about Jim, the superstar salesman from Dunder Mifflin. Dwight says, what, Jim? No, no, he's not, not a superstar. He is a complete moron, okay? And Pam is laughing, and Jim makes a fake surprised face with the camera. <laughs> and Nellie says, oh, forgive me. Clearly, I was given the wrong information. Now, how stupid is he exactly? Where would you rank his intelligence on a scale with Albert Einstein at the top going all the way down to beat farmer (laughs) and Dwight says wait wait, wait, what beat lower lower way lower the beat farmer and so then Jim gives Nellie the next bit of information for this Jim she says okay okay so somewhere between beat farmer and Battlestar Galactica fan (laughs) and Dwight says no no Iris your skill is utterly wrong (laughs) I was laughing so hard that that is so great that's when I wish that they had put in because that was really yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, it is so good. There was an alternate scene with Angela discussing how difficult the election had been for the senator and uh, another dirty joke about how the senator is always on top of the election. <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah. Pete tells Aaron a secret. My job is not very demanding. Shh. Keep it down. If you ever have an emergency or you need to take a depressed boyfriend out for lunch or something, let me know. I'll cover the phones for you. Shh. Aaron says, wow, that is so nice of you. But do you know how to use the phone system? And P says, are you kidding me? Check me out. And he grabs her keyboard and mouse and pretends they're a phone and he answers it. Dunder Mifflin, this is Pete. Aaron says, very good. But what if you have to take a phone message? And the phone is actually ringing at this point. And you think, okay, she'll answer the phone and she'll show Pete how to do it. Or she'll give the phone to Pete and have him try to do it himself. But instead, she pretends it's a pen and says, take a pen, take a piece of paper, write down the message. And Pete just is like, hey, hey, there's there's somebody actually on the phone that you're using as a pencil right now. <laughs> and she's like, like oh, yes. And she, so she answers, Dunder Mifflin, this is Aaron. And she just like shakes her head like, I can't believe myself. What a rookie mistake. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about that scene is that we learned that Pete volunteered to cover the phones for Aaron so that mm-hmm. she could take Andy to lunch. It was his idea. Like, hey, go take out Andy. Go cheer him up. So that's a really sweet thing, even if he is. Yeah attracted to her even if he does like her he wants them to have a shot you know yeah yeah he's he's it he's was his guy. idea to do something nice for andy that's great we see aaron and andy playing car games on the way i guess to the uh, to the harbor singing songs about the towns in connecticut and playing punch buggy although uh who is it andy doesn't seem to enjoy punch buggy very much yeah apparently because he's losing it yeah. seems <laughs> uh and she does punch him pretty hard yeah Aaron has a talking head. She says, yeah, boy, guess who was totally there for her boyfriend when his family fell apart and he was spiraling in despair? This little shorty. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Out of nowhere. Trying to be cool. Daryl is really excited to use the sound effects on his keyboard for the radio show. Of course, he's he doesn't get a ton of action in the episode, but here he does. He's kind of joking around. He's like, oh, look, it's old McDonald's farm. And he's probably looking for like a moo or a chicken sound. 
mm-hmm. but he can't find the sound and he just like plunks on the keyboard and can't find it. But then he does get to utilize his, his keyboard when Jim, as the chief of police, is talking about his time growing up in Atlanta because he has apparently put on this stereotypical, not flattering <laughs> persona as the chief of police. We got a little bit of that in the episode when Jim first adopted that voice and persona and Daryl just sort of slapped him on the elbow like, what the hell was that? Daryl hits a gunshot sound effect and then... Iris slash Nellie says, ladies and gentlemen, shots have been fired. And Phyllis opens up a carbonated drink and Dwight hears. And he's like, what was that? What was that? And uh, they they decide it was a tear gas canister. So stuff is really (laughs) going down at David Wallace's house. And that is it for our deleted scenes. Yeah, that in fact, that's that's it it for for everything. (laughs) Yeah, we did it. Hey, Uh, I was kind of worried this was going to be a little bit of a shorter episode. Um, My notes aren't super extensive for these two episodes and i didn't necessarily think either of them were super funny either but honestly my cheeks kind of hurt because i feel like (laughs) i've been laughing a lot of this episode so yeah anyways that's the end of the official 97th episode of an american workplace we didn't have any voicemails this week so definitely send in some voicemails uh we're always happy for all these things that we're about to talk about. So I'll leave it for that. Uh, <laughs> contact for the show, facebook.com slash workplace pod and at workplace pod on Twitter. Please go over to Apple podcasts, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, that's always a big help to us. Uh, iTunes and Apple podcasts just added new categories for podcasts. And so we are officially listed as a TV review show. And if you go to their TV review section in the app, at least we are there, which is pretty cool along with a few other office podcasts and lots of other shows. But we are featured in a category right now, which is pretty awesome. If you have feedback and ideas for us, you can email workplacepod at gmail.com. And as I said, if you would like to leave us a voicemail, we would love to play you on the show. Try to keep it to a minute or less. Be specific. Be quick with what your intentions are. Dial 93 Pretz Day. That is 937-738-9329. And one last thing. Uh, we are streaming on Twitch live right now, and we are planning to do that for every episode to the end of the show. So watch our socials every week. We are not consistent with a time or day to record, but we will always let you know as we are going live. So keep an eye out. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623. I'm also at facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place to find me is at chadadada on Twitter. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also facebook.com slash chad.hopkins and my other podcast, Cinescope. You can find it where podcasts can be found and at thecinescopepodcast.com. Show notes and all contact information for this show can be found at workplacepodcast.com. If you want a shout out and more of an American workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline and notes, a logo sticker and bonus episodes, check out our Patreon page and pick the support level you think is worth it to you at patreon.com slash workplace pod. And that is all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 97 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 98 for our discussion on the next two episodes of season nine, The Whale and The Target. Bye. Bye. Pete tells Aaron a secret. Says, my job is not very demandy. Demandy. (laughs) I used Nelly's nickname.